And so if God tells me to go do something, even if I see it as dangerous, I understand that God actually knows what's going on here and God protects him. You notice how that verse ends in verse 14. It says, and Saul searched for him every day, but God did not hand him over to him. See, God's always the one in control. Saul doesn't have control. He has the illusion of control. And that's the difference here. God's the one actually orchestrating these events. God's actually the one that's protecting David. Hey, fellow tacticians. Be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on Tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be continuing our series in 1 Samuel. And just to, for those of you that may not have seen the last Chaplain's Report that we did on this, to give a little bit of background, David got the call from God that God commanded him while he's on the run from Saul and trying to hide out in the wilderness with a troop of men. He said, there are some Philistines attacking the city of Kilah, and I want you to go down there and liberate the city from Philistine influence. And he says, okay, are you going to make me victorious in battle? And God says, yes. Some of his men, very hesitant about this because they said, look, Kilah is kind of a trap. It's a, a double barred city. We go down there and we, even if we wind up beating the Philistines, we're going to get stuck and Saul is going to capture us and he's seeking to kill us. Which, by the way, totally legitimate fear, and we're going to see that here in the verse in just a second. But David winds up going ahead and doing it anyway because it's what God told him to do. And so that's how we arrive at this little episode and kind of Saul's reaction to these events playing out. So let's look at 1 Samuel 23, verses 10 through 14. Then David said, Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard for certain that Saul is seeking to come to Kilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the citizens of Kalah hand me over to him? Will Saul come down just as your servant has heard? Lord God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the citizens of Kilah hand me and my men over to Saul? And the Lord said, they will hand you over. And then David and his men, about 600, rose up and departed from Kilah, and they went wherever they could go. When it was reported to Saul, that David could had that David had escaped from Kalah, he gave up the pursuit. And David stayed in the wilderness in the strongholds and remained in the hill country, in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul searched for him every day, but God did not hand him over to him. You know that old saying that no good deed goes unpunished? If you're David in this situation, you have got to feel like that. And he has a great deal of, of strength of character and endurance, and I think that that is shown throughout the narrative of 1 Samuel. But dang it, if you don't feel bad for him on this stuff, this is a guy that just put himself in great personal risk, knowing that the king, the ruler with absolute power in his own country, is trying to kill him. And he went out of his way to rescue people of the city from an invasion from foreign actors. And when he does that, not only is he pinned up against a wall so that his enemy can capture him, but he asks God, are the people of the city that I just saved going to turn me over? And God says, yep, so you better get out of there pretty quick. You see how easy it would be to feel defeated on that? I mean, David just went out of his way and put he and his own men's lives at risk to save these people and they're about to turn him into his enemy. You gotta feel betrayed after something like that. And I just think that it's so relatable to see David having to deal with this because I kind of feel the same way from time to time. I really do, and I don't mean to, but I think that every person 
feels like this from time to time. You wonder if the things that you're doing, or the good that you're trying to do, is it even working? Is it even actually making a difference? And sometimes, even when we do good to people, we feel like our only reward for it is more grief and heartache. Sometimes people disappoint us. Often people disappoint us. Sometimes you try to lead somebody to the gospel and you get harassed at work or told that you're not allowed to do that anymore. I mean, there are times where doing what God asked, which is exactly what David did, it results in us being chastised for it. We feel like we're trying to do the right thing, and then instead of being rewarded, the exact opposite happens. And I got to believe that that's kind of where David was when all of this happened. He's got to feel like no good deed goes unpunished, that he just did all of this for these people, and they're about to turn him over to his mortal enemy. And notice how in both of these instances, because going back to the original story that we looked at in verses 1 through 5, when David is seeking advice and guidance, his first instinct, okay, let's ask God about it. Let's see what God would want us to do, and then we'll do that. And he even got resistance from his own men and said, nope, God said to do this, we're doing this. And then when he's in trouble again and when he thinks that Saul might come and, and you know pin him up against the wall there and have him stuck in that city to where he could capture him, what does he do then? He goes to God. And I think this is part of the reason that David is such a strong and effective leader and something I wish our own leaders here in America and in the state of Alabama and in the city of Montgomery would emulate. And I also think, and this is very important as well, that this is the reason that God refers to him as somebody that had a heart that sought him, a man after God's own heart. I think the reason that he has that title is because for all his flaws and, and problems and, and things that we see that are not all that flattering to David, he always wanted to see what God was going to do and, and do the best thing that he could to try to serve him. And to he always sought God's favor and sought to do what God would have wanted him to do. Sometimes he failed at that, just like all of us do. But that was his first instinct, is to go to God and try to see what God thought about what he was doing before he acted. There's an awful lot of people that act and then say, sorry, God. David was proactive in this, and he actively sought out God's counsel when he was going to make decisions. But here's another thing that I wanted to point out about this passage as well. Was David ever really in danger? Because think about the way I just presented what we were talking about. I said that Saul has supreme and absolute power in Israel. Does he? From a human perspective, yes. Any order that Saul gave his men were obliged to obey. And under the law of Israel, he had the right to bring forth his wrath upon anybody that he so chose. There were no limits written into the law for a king in that sense. But in the law of Moses, and when I say that, I mean by extension, the law of God, we understand that the covenant with Israel is that God is the king of Israel. He is the true ruler. And the reason that David was a good king is because David recognized that. David understood that his power and influence, even though he was king, were limited and were contingent upon God. Saul did it. Saul didn't consult God. Sometimes he actively rebelled against God. And ultimately, he saw things he didn't consult with God. He just, as we talked about in the verse right there, Saul just finds out about it and he's like, okay, let's go down there. He didn't. Did Saul ever ask what God thought about that? Did he ever ask, is me going down and capturing the city and, and taking David as prisoner and killing him, is that something God would want me to do? Thought never crossed his mind to ask about God and how he felt about it. And so it shows a very strong contrast between these two. But it also emphasizes that Saul's not really the one that's in control here. And that's the reason that David trusted him. It's the reason that David is willing to put his life in God's hands is because he understands that even though it seems from human eyes that Saul has all the power and all the influence, and even though David is smart in the sense that he understands, like he doesn't just sit around and wait for God to save him, he actually takes steps and, and does things to try to preserve his own life as well, but he consults God and involves him in that process where Saul doesn't. 
And that's because he understood that as long as God is on my side, it doesn't really matter whether Saul is against me or not. That's a lesson that David learned with Goliath as well. It doesn't really matter how tall Goliath is or how powerful he is or how many weapons he has or how much more experience he has than me. I've got God on my side, so I win regardless. And he understood that about Saul as well. Yes, Saul has every advantage here. Um, he has the entire country on his side. He has a much bigger military, a better equipped military. I've just got like a ragtag group of vagabonds here. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because God's on my side. And I try to make sure that I am on his side. And because of that, I'm going to be the one that prevails. And so if God tells me to go do something, even if I see it as dangerous, I understand that God actually knows what's going on here and God protects him. You notice how that verse ends in verse 14. It says, and Saul searched for him every day, but God did not hand him over to him. See, God's always the one in control. Saul doesn't have control. He has the illusion of control. And that's the difference here. God's the one actually orchestrating these events. God's actually the one that's protecting David and making sure that he does what he would need to do to make sure that he is safe from Saul. And I think that the lesson that we can take from that is if we are seeking to do God's will and help others like David did with the city of Kalat, even if the people didn't appreciate it, even if the people rejected him and the people were, they were willing to turn David over to protect their own hide, even when that happens to us, the cruelty and the disloyalty of human beings doesn't matter if we're on God's side because God is going to be looking out for us. God is going to be protecting us. That doesn't mean we're never going to suffer. It doesn't mean it's not going to hurt when people betray us, as I'm sure it hurt David when this happened to him. But what it does mean is ultimately we'll be okay because God is going to be watching out for us. So what man does to us really doesn't make a big difference. And I think that's the takeaway here because humans, even ones that David protected and did things for, they weren't faithful. But God is always faithful. David knew that, he understood it, and his behavior reflected that knowledge that God was always faithful. Stay the course, friends. If you're watching this because you liked this video, awesome. Be sure to like and subscribe and click that little notification bell. If you're a leftist that's only here to hate watch, hang on before you punch that dislike button. You see, I identify as a Hispanic woman, so if you dislike this video, that's literally violence against me and you are now guilty of a hate crime. Why do you hate beautiful trans people of color like me? What you gonna do now, Woke Brigade?